in real life. Hi, and welcome to the <laughs> yeah, welcome to the final uh, session of today. So we're joined by Alberto Cairo from Miami, Florida. Uh, he's a journalist and designer and a night chair and visual journalism at the School of Communication at the University of Miami. Um, he's also written several textbooks. Uh, it's the, the director of the visualization program at UMM Center for Computational Design. Um, so we're very excited to have him here today. We'll have a one hour session. If you have any questions, you can ask them. There's a little box that says ask a, quest, ask a question and hopefully we'll get to him. We'll get to them uh, towards the end. And yeah, say hi in the chat if you can hear us and we're excited to welcome you on stage, Alberto. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here this uh, morning or afternoon for, for you. Uh, Miami, Florida. Right now it's 11, 11, 15 a.m. Anyway, so I'm going to on my screen. The topic that I would like to to talk about today is making decisions in in visualization. So uh, some of you, you already work uh, in data visualization, may may have stumbled upon some of my some of my books at some point in the past. Uh, the latest one is titled um, a How Chat Slide, which was published last year. And it just came out in um, a, a, in paperback um, the same year. But what I would like to talk to do, what I would like to do today is to go a little bit beyond, go a little bit beyond the book, and not talk about that topic in particular, but talk more about how to make decisions in in visualization. And the reason why I I, I would like to talk about this is that um, I think that we are living through a second golden age of data visualization. The first golden age of data visualization happened in the 19th century with the work of um, a, a people whose names may sound very familiar with many of, for many of you, such as a Florence Nightingale, the famous British nurse, a head of nursing in several hospitals during the war in Russia in the middle of the 19th century who created many beautiful data visualizations. A Dr. John Snow, a British doctor who mapped um, outbreaks of cholera in London and in other places and many other people in the 19th century. But right now we are living through a second golden age of data visualization, which in my opinion began around the 70s or the 80s of the last century. And it really, really picked up um, speed by the beginning of the 2000s, right, with the widespread use of digital data. And right now, data visualization is becoming a universal language, something that is being adopted in many different realms for many different purposes. There is a, an explosion of the number of tools that are used, not only tools, but also programming languages, including R, but also Python and many others that allow you to create rich and complex and beautiful data visualizations. In my own realm, the realm of journalism, I, I, many projects based on data visualizations have quickly become um, the most popular content ever published. By many organizations. In the Times, for example, for many years, the most popular piece of content that they had ever published online uh, it was a data visualization, commonly called the, uh, uh, the quiz map, the dialect quiz map. And the way that it works is that, um, and again, uh, something that I forgot to mention at the very beginning, um, the slides are going to be shared with you later. Um, so you will be able to click on all these things that I'm showing. But essentially, this, what this tool does is that you can input. <clears throat> the, 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 the application asks you how you say something in English or how do you pronounce something in English. And depending on the answers uh, to those questions, the, it will create a, a fully customized map that shows you where you are from. If you were, if you are from the United States, obviously this only works if you speak American English. More recently, uh, it was announced uh, a few months ago that the most popular piece of content ever published by the Washington Post uh, online was also based on visualizations. It's a um, it's a project that tries to show what happens throughout a pandemic, how a pandemic spreads depending on the measures that a government takes to control that pandemic. And it does that through several beautiful dot visualizations, dots sort of like pass the disease to each other and so on. Here is uh, showing whether if the government doesn't take any measures, 
down here is showing whether the government starts imposing, for example, social distancing, that you know the spread is much slower. Anyway, the most popular uh, story ever published by the Washington Post online. But not only that, a few months later, the Washington Post announced that out of the seven most viewed stories ever published by the Washington Post online, six of them, six out of seven, had been produced by the graphics desk, by the visualization desk at the Washington Post online. And this fact, the popularity of data visualization, at least in news media, it is true also in media and many other media organizations, not only the Washington Post or the New York Times, but I have been hearing all these stories like these from many other places, such as ProPublica, the Miami Herald, and many other media publications. This shows you that, shows us, I think, that visualization has a great power to inform, and it also has a great power to attract people's attention to important issues. But at the same time, the fact that it's so powerful, the fact that we have so much power in our hands, also puts in our hands a huge responsibility to inform people, not to misinform them, right? To try to get things right. And this is what I have been devoting my career in the past, career in the past decade or so, to try to help people first become better designers of journalistic graphics, later helping other people become better readers of graphics through my latest book, How Chats Lie. Um, and right now, what I'm thinking about is uh, writing something new about helping everyone who produces a data visualization, right? And this may include potentially everyone, because I think that visualization, again, is becoming a universal language, helping everyone make better decisions in a visualization, helping people reason about data visualizations, about the main choices, the ma main choices that we make whenever we design a graphic. The first step, though, would be to abandon certain myths that surround uh, conversations around data visualization, right? Certain myths that I believe that either are wrong or are misguided or will require a second half of a sentence appended to them in order to become true. For example, the present a picture is worth a thousand words. And this is not true. It is only true if you know how to read that image, as I will just show you in just one minute. Or visualization is intuitive. Well, not always, right? Visualization is a language. Therefore, it has a grammar, it has a syntax. And in order to understand a visualization, you need to know how the visualization works. Or the third one, very common in business analytics, the data should speak for itself. That sh just show me the data. Well, that myth is really dangerous because the data only speaks for itself when you, the designer, are presenting the data to someone who has the same level of base knowledge that you have. If the data is shown, if the graphic is shown to someone who doesn't share that same level of knowledge, that graphic is very likely to be misinterpreted, right? So you need to consider, we need to consider who the audience is. And the data sometimes will never speak for itself. We need to explain it. And then the last myth, very common in the world that I come from, the world of graphic design and, and, and journalism, show and tell. Well, no, we need to show and we need to tell. We need to show and we need to explain, as I will show you in just one minute. This is an example of why the first myth in particular is not true. Let me show you the following picture, just to show you how ambiguous pictures can be. Now, if you've ever been to the United States, uh, uh, you probably know how to read this image, because this image uh, embodies the slogan of Dunkin' Donuts, Dunkin' Donuts' slogan. Dunkin' Donuts' slogan is, America runs on Dunkin', right? But if you didn't know the, if you didn't know the slogan beforehand, before seeing the image, you may interpret this image in many different ways. For example, you may ask yourself, if you know nothing about Dunkin' Donuts, why is this person running away from the United States? I mean, that make, makes sense these days, right? Considering everything that is going on in the United States, but that is not the way that the image is supposed to be read. But it's a plausible interpretation of the image. If we believe that myth of a show, don't tell. I show, but I don't tell you how to read it, therefore you will misinterpret it. My daughter, by the way, when she was younger, the first time that she show, she saw this, um, this picture on a Dunkin' Donuts uh, cup, uh, she stared at it, very puzzled, and she asked, Daddy, why is that person waving from inside a toilet? 
I said, what do you mean a toilet? And then I looked twice to the image and I realized that what she was seeing was a tilted toilet and a person coming out of the toilet and waving his or her hand, right? So that's another possible interpretation of that image. There's a fifth myth though, right? That I think that we also need to abandon, which is that um, many people tend to believe that the design of visualization can be based on rules that are set in stone, right? Um, minimize data ink ratio, or um, never use pie charts or similar rules like that, right? Well, I have come to believe that whenever discussing visualization, we should not approach visualization as if it were, it could be taught as a set of rules that are, that are set in stone. We need to approach the learning of visualization and the teaching of visualization in a similar way that we approach the teaching or write, of writing, right? Because I think that, again, data visualization is a language. And it is similar to writing in the sense that writing as visualization is based on a vocabulary and a syntax or a grammar that sort of like shows you how to arrange the symbols in order for the symbols to make sense, right? Visualization is very similar, right? Probably, I mean, if you have used the the, the R programming language, uh, you're very likely familiar with the tidyverse, and within the tidyverse, you have ggplot2. ggplot2 is a library that is based on a book titled The Grammar of Graphics that shows, sort of like explains how data visualizations are built, what is the scaffolding symbols and the grammar of those graphics. But once we understand the grammar of a language, how a language works, the mechanics of that language, what we do with that language cannot be based on rules that are set in stone. Everybody will have a slightly different style. Everybody will say things in a different, in a slightly different way, in one way or another. And it's difficult to tell sometimes whether one way to say something is better, objectively speaking, than another, than another approach. It's super, super difficult. So after we have understood the grammar and the graphics, what we do with that language, with that grammar and those symbols, is a matter of making recent justifiable choices. And this is something that I try to instill in my own students, the sense that every step that we take in, the, in a visualization should have a reason to exist, right? And every, every step that we don't take in a data visualization should also have a reason not to take it, right? Now, the idea of reason is very present in the literature of a moral philosophy, right? One of my favorite moral philosophers is a, is a, a, a Briton, a, a Derek Parfait, who had a, has a wonderful book titled On What Matters, which is all about the idea of reason, so giving ourselves reasons to act in one way or another. And he says that when we know facts, right, when we discover facts, right, either through empirical evidence or through logic or through discussion and conversation, those facts can give us reasons when they count in favor of having some belief or acting in some way. This is the type of mind frame, the type of mental scaffolding that I would like every visualization designer to develop. Not think about, about visualization in terms of rules. Do this, don't do that. But try to always explain why we do things, to reason ourselves and to reason towards others, right, in order to explain our decisions. Now, this reasoning can be guided or can be structured as a series of questions. Probably the, the, the next book that I will write at some point, crossing my fingers, will be a structure around several questions that we can may pose ourselves whenever we design a graphic. And I'm going to show you just five or six of those questions. The first one is the simplest one. Why should my visualization exist in the first place, right? Which, which may sound silly, but it is not that silly. In many cases, when we are communicating data, we don't need a visualization, right? For instance, let's suppose that you want to present data to the public or a data to a, to a stakeholder, to a decision maker in your company or in a newspaper, or whatever. And the purpose of your chart is to sh help people uh, see each specific value on the data set. Well, if the purpose of that of the display that you're going to create is to show every specific value, you don't need a visualization, right? You need a table, right? You need a, just a numerical table in which you organize the data in columns and rows and people can sort of like crisscross, row column, and locate every single value. So if that is the purpose of the display, you don't need a data visualization. When do we need a data visualization? Well, we need data visualizations when what matters more to us is not each specific value. 
we need a data visualization when what we want to de detect is broader patterns and trends in the data, right? Or when we want to pose questions related to those patterns. For instance, this is a data set that shows the variation of average global temperatures in the world between the year 1000 up to the year 2000, right? Now, can we ask questions or answer questions through this display, the numerical table? Well, sure, we can. We can take a look at the year 1888 and see what the temperature was that year. By the way, you see a negative number because these are uh, the temperatures here are measured in Celsius degrees, uh, e taking as a reference as a baseline, as a zero baseline, the average of the 20th century. So this means the, the temperature this year was 0 0.13, whatever, below the 20th century average, right? That's the reason why we have those numbers. So if the purpose of the display or the question that you have is, what was the temperature in the year 1890? Well, you can answer that question through the table. But what if the, you know, what, what about if the question is a little bit more difficult? For example, you know, is the temperature today, on average, uh, higher than it used to be 1,000 years ago? Well, that's a little bit harder to answer through a table alone because it forces you to navigate the table up and down or, or to write a short script to detect the biggest and the lowest numbers. Let me take some work, right? But through a visualization, it may be simpler because you may simply see a chart showing whether things have increased or decreased, right? So when the purpose, again, is detecting a pattern or a, tr or a trend, visualizing our data becomes absolutely necessary. Right? The data that I have just shown you is the source of one of the most famous data visualizations designed in the 20th century called the hockey stick chart, which basically shows that between the year 1000 up to the year 1900, global temperatures varied, right? But they varied within a certain range. Beginning of the 20th century, they spiked very rapidly, and this line actually continued increasing uh, towards the present. The chart also shows the level of uncertainty of the data. It shows you the directionality of the data with the smooth over here. So it has other, other features other than just the point, just the point estimates. But the point is, in a very small space, we are able to detect the story that hides behind the data, right? It's sort of like relatively flat a change and then the sudden spike in the last 100 years. That's a pattern that we could not visualize easily if we only take a look at the numbers alone. So it will be a good reason in this case, if the purpose of this place is to show the patterns, not the individual numbers, but give us a reason to design a visualization. Remember that it's always about reasoning, making choices of visualization always based on reason. Another question, whenever we design a visualization, is what to visualize, and obviously how to visualize it, but we will get to that in just one minute. So what to visualize? This is related to understanding the numbers that we are presenting, right? Understanding the numbers that we are presenting and analyzing them correctly. In my world, the world of journalism, this is a huge problem, because sometimes we, we journalists visualize data without clearly understanding what it is that we are visualizing. I'm going to show you just an example uh, that appears, by the way, in my latest book, How Chats Lie. So a, a, a student of mine, um, Luis Melgar, who is right now a, a data journalist at the Wall Street Journal, he made his, when he was a student with me, he made his custom project, he made his master's project about homelessness in Florida. He wanted to see how many students in the state of Florida, uh, here in the United States, are homeless, right? So he gathered data, right? The government has tons of data. Luis gathered data, talked to experts, started visualizing the data, and he came to my office with several graphics. And some of them shocked me, right? Take a look at these maps, for example, these Coropleth maps. These maps show that in certain counties in Florida, more than 5,000 students, more than 6,000 students are homeless. And then when you take a look at percentages, you will see that there are certain counties in Florida in which where uh, more than 20% of students, one out of five are homeless. So I said, oh, wow, and my, re my reaction was, whoa, right? Well, that reaction of mine was misguided because I was jumping to, I was jumping to conclusions because I had not read carefully what the word homeless means in this context, which is something that was explained to me by Luis during this conversation. He said, probably when you looked at these graphics, the idea of a homeless person that came to your mind is someone who lives on the streets, right? Someone who doesn't have a home. But that is 
not just a homeless person. To the state of Florida, a homeless person is someone who doesn't have a permanent home, which is entirely different, right? So, for instance, if a student uh, comes or, or, or lives in a family and this family cannot maintain a home all year round, they need to switch homes three times a year, for example, that a student may, may, may become part of the um, uh, of the data set that student will be considered a homeless person not because that student doesn't have a home but because she doesn't have a permanent home which is different now this doesn't render the data set wrong but it tells you something it tells us something about how easy it is for any of us to jump to conclusions when we read a, read a particular word and not only that how important it is to never believe that myth that i told you before let the data speak for itself or show me, don't tell me. No, 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 no. You need to show me the data, but we need, as data visualizers, to clearly explain what we mean by the words that we have. So the final versions of these graphics included clear explanations of what the word homeless means in this context. Now, uh, understanding our data also has to do, is related to understanding the uncertainties and the glitches in the data, right? This may lead to very, you know, uh, critical problems uh, in data communication. A while ago, for instance, uh, El País, which is the most important newspaper in Spain, this happened around 2014, if I remember well, published a four-column story uh, in front of the newspaper saying that in Catalonia, the region of Catalonia in Spain, the no to independence of the region was higher than the yes to independence in the region. As you probably know, Catalonia is a region in Spain where around half of the population is in favor of Catalonia becoming an independent country, and a rather, another roughly half of the population is against that idea. They want Catalonia to remain as part of Spain, right? Anyway, so El País published this story saying, According to the survey, it's a survey that was conducted by the Catalonian government, according to this survey, the no to independence is higher than the yes to independence. Well, is this true? It is not true. It is not true because the at least it is probabilistically dangerous to say that it is true, I would say, because the graphics uh, that were included in these actually show that, sure, I mean, the, the percentage of people who said no to independence in the survey was 45.3%, and the people who said yes to independence was 44.5%. But here comes one of the critical things. 10% of people had no opinion, and we would not know how these people will vote if there were an independence referendum in Catalonia. We don't know where these people will, what, what, what direction these people will take. Uh, so that's a source of uncertainty that is hard to quantify. But not, not only that, quantified uncertainty or quantifiable uncertainty is also critical in this particular case because we don't know what the confidence interval is. Well, the story itself, in the story itself, the reporter who wrote this story said, the margin of error is three percentage point. And then the reporter added a relevant fact considering the tight difference between the yes and the no to independence. When I read this story, I was shocked. I said, well, obviously, of course it is relevant. It is super, super relevant. I mean, if I were to write this story myself, I would never dare titling it saying that the no is bigger than the yes or that the yes is bigger than the no. All that I would dare to say is that they seem to be tied just because the level of uncertainty around those point estimates or those, res those results in the survey is so wide, it's super, super wide, and we need to take that into consideration. So one of the resources that I have included at the end of the presentation, remember that I'm going to share the slides with you, um, it has to, it's, it's a collection of readings about uncertainty and about how to visualize this uncertainty. Which I think it's going to, it's going to be, or it's already, it already is, one of the main challenges that we face in data visualization, when to show uncertainty and how to show that uncertainty. And I have come to believe that maybe we may want to start making our graphics fuzzier, right? Fuzzier than they are. Because sometimes data visualizations convey an unwarranted impression of precision or accuracy that is not really there, right? We create these bar graphs that are a like super sharp edge, right? And sometimes we know that that is actually not true. That may be a little bit misleading. So what if we fuzzy the boundaries of those bars a little bit just to convey readers, yes, this is our best guess, but we are not completely sure.
And when to show this uncertainty, right? When do we have a good reason to show the uncertainty? Well, in this particular case, there is a very good reason to show the uncertainty just because the point estimates are so close to each other. So I think that it is critical to show the uncertainty. I would have my doubts, for instance, if the results were very, very different. For example, if the no to independence were like 80% and the yes to independence were like 20%, in that case, I would still show the uncertainty of the, the calculators, uh, calculated uncertainty in the data, but it would not be as critical as it is in a case like this. As I said before, it's all about the reasoning. It's all about the conversation that we need to have with ourselves whenever we design a visualization or with the people who design the visualization with us also to give us reasons to do something or not to do something. Another question when we visualize our data is how to explain that data, right? As I said before, we need to show and tell. There is a component in any visualization that I think that particularly people who come from a background in data science, statistics, the sciences in general, we forget just because we tend to believe, right? Or you tend to believe because I don't have that background, I'm a journalist, right? You tend to believe that we just need to show the data. Well, no, as I said before, we also need to explain it, particularly if we are showing that data to people who don't know as much as we do about the data at hand. Now, that element that I think that sometimes is forgotten in data visualization, we call that the annotation layer. What is the annotation layer? The annotation layer is essentially the words that we can add to a visualization to put the data in context, to emphasize what matters in the chart, to reinforce the main messages that people should not miss in the chart, to put the data in context, to explain it, and so on and so forth. When the pandemic began, uh, Brian Stelter from, from CNN, one of the presenters of CNN, he showed the famous flatten the curve graphic on TV, but he didn't just show the graphic and talked about something else. He showed the graphic, he put himself in front of the graphic, and he explained people how to read the graphic, try to emphasize the main message the main stories that that graphic was, was already saying. You may think that this is redundant, but it is not redundant. It really helps people to be shown and to be told the main points that a graphic is that a graphic is showing. That's the annotation layer at works at work. Um, a person who I think that we could take um, inspiration from on how to do this, probably many of you are familiar with him, is a, a, a Hans Rosling, the famous statistician and medical doctor from Sweden, who became super super famous in 2006 thanks to a TED talk that went viral and it was fantastic and great etc um he sadly passed a few years ago before he passed he wrote a book titled factfulness which is a lot of fun if you have ever uh, listened to one of hans, Ros hans rosling's presentations when you read the book it's almost like you, you are hearing him speaking because he has that same sort of a, like a, a fun a, a tone of voice and humor that he uses in these presentations. Rosling, I think, was one of the greatest examples on how to use the annotation layer in visualization effectively. Let me show you one, uh, one portion of a documentary that he made for the BBC a few years ago titled The Joy of Stats. Uh, that segment, in that segment, Rosling appears on screen and he says, let me talk to you about the world. Let me tell you, tell you a little bit about the history of the world. But before I tell you anything, I'm going to show you a graphic. This graphic will have a vertical axis that corresponds to life and a horizontal axis that corresponds to income, right? So the further to the right in this case, the more income you, a country has. If a country is down here on this corner, that means that country on average is poor and sick. If a country is up here on this other corner, it means that that country on average is rich and healthy. So now let me, let's the country appears. Let's the country, let the countries appear on this scale, right? Each one of the countries will be represented by a bubble. They will be colored by content corresponds to Asians and so forth. And the size of the bubble corresponds to the size of the population. And as you can see, most countries back in 1810 were down here. That means that in general, they tended to be poor and very unhealthy, right? To the point that even the best countries in the world had a life expectancy of just 40 years old, which is really low for modern standards. But start playing the world and animate this graphic and move the world forward towards the present, we will notice that these bubbles will start moving right to the right, so more income, you know, and also they will start moving up, meaning that the life expectancy of those countries is also, is also increasing.
Well, later on in the segment, he explained the differences within the countries because he takes China and he starts splitting China and saying, well, uh, here we're seeing we're seeing average, right? averages, world averages, right? But we could take any of these countries and start splitting into regions and we will see that there are great disparities within each one of these countries. This is one of the greatest examples of the use of the annotation layer that I have ever seen. Not only because he explained the data, but because of what he did before showing any data, which is that he first explained the grammar of the graphic, position, the what we call in visualization, the encodings of the graphic, or if you use ggplot2, the aesthetics of the graphic, right? What are the aesthetics? Position, position on the horizontal axis, position on the vertical axis. What is another encoding or aesthetic? Bubbles, the bubble size is proportional to the population of those countries. What is another aesthetic or another encoding? Color, right? That's a categorical aesthetic, right? Color corresponds to the continent. So he was explaining the grammar of the graphic before showing the graphic to the public. Why? I can only guess. But my guess is that he knew that a substantial portion of the audience who was watching the BBC that day probably had never seen a scatter plot or he had forgotten how to read a scatterplot. And then he thought, well, this is so complex, so difficult to read. And what Rosling did was to help people overcome that fear. This is not that hard. Anybody can understand it. Let me show you how. That democratizes visualization. There is a lot of power in this type of presentation. In the Financial Times, one of my favorite um, sources of visualization goodness nowadays, uh, they had an excellent team of visualization designers. John Murdoch, who is one of the main designers in the graphics team, graphics and data team at the Financial Times, there was an interview with him a while ago, and he said that the graphics team at the Financial Times, this Times, they think that the most important thing that they do is not the graphics. The visualizations are important, obviously, but they think that the most important thing that they do is to add that annotation layer to help people make sense of the data. Because the purpose of visualization is not the visualization. The visualization is an instrumental goal, right? In philosophy, we talk about instrumental goals and final goals, right? So to speak, the, the, the final goal of a visualization is not the visualization. The final goal of a visualization is helping people make sense of something, right? That the instrumental goal is the visualization or the instrumental means that we use for that, right? To achieve that goal will be the visualization in combination with in combination with words in this particular case. And sometimes words can be essential. Many times I say words can be essential to understanding a visualization. There's another question, how much to visualize, meaning what level of detail do we in this visualization? Different communities who work with data tend to default to um, different levels of detail whenever we visualize data. In general, this is sort of like a, a gross simplification on my part, but in general, for example, we journalists tend to oversimplify things too much, way too much. And people who work in sciences tend to overcomplicate things, trying to show every single detail in the data at the same level without any care about hierarchy, for example, visual hierarchy. And that's also a problem. We need to find a step in between. Let me show you an example, an example of a simplification, right? I usually say whenever I talk about visualization that the goal of a visualization is not to simplify, it is to clarify. And in order to clarify something, we need to find that middle ground between oversimplifying and overcomplicating the city talking between the two. So this is a graphic that shows the murder rate in the United States. And it's a graphic that per se, as it is built, it's it's right. It's a it's a it's a correct graphic, right? Showing you the variation, the murder rate increasing in the 80s, going back in the 2000, down in the 2000s. In the past two or three years, the murder rate in the US has started increasing. If we extend this line towards the present, the murder rate continues increasing. Now, what is the challenge here? Well, that this is just the national rate, right? And this graphic can be extremely misleading to people who don't know the details behind this sort of like national average, so to speak, right? Now, what is the problem? Well, that the problem is that the distribution between these is very, very skewed. Many or most places in the United States, if we could plot them, on the vertical axis, most places will be around here, right? The murder rate in the United States in most places is quite low, right? The United States is in general a quite safe country. Now, what is the challenge though? The challenge is that in the past 
four or five years or something like that. There are certain places in the United States that because of different reasons have become much more violent and they go through the roof. They will go through the roof if we try to plot them on the, um, on the same scale as the others. And that sort of like skews the national rate a little bit according to statisticians who work with this with these data. So what is the message here? At least the message that I try to convey to my journalists, colleagues, whenever I discuss projects like this, is, that, is to say, if you only show me these and you don't explain what lies behind this data, you are you are not informing me. You are misinforming me. You need to show me this, but then you need to explain this to me. If you can show it, try to show it. But if you cannot show it just because you don't have data at a more granular level, you don't have data at the local level, for example, at least add the annotation, at least explain it to me so I can figure it out what is going on. Don't oversimplify. <coughs> Don't overcomplicate either. For example, I would not show every single town or every single neighborhood because that will obscure the graphic needlessly, right? It will make the graphic incomprehensible, right? For no good reason, right? So we need to find a way in to find a, a spot in between those two uh, extremes. Then five, fifth question out of out of six: How to visualize it? This is related to the question of. You know, how to make choices in terms of how to encode the data, right? Or the types of graphics that we use to represent the data. Should we use angle, position, length? Should we use a bar graph, a pie chart, a map, etc.? Every type of visualization has its purposes. And the way to choose a visualization will be to reason about those purposes or from those purposes, right? You begin with the idea that you want to convey or the task that you want people to be able to accomplish through the graphic, what you want people to see. And then according to that, according to what you want to show, you can choose one graphic form or another graphic form. Quick example. This is a graphic that shows where migrants who arrived to Greece in 2016 came from, right? Where they came from, all of them, in 2016. As you can see, half of them came from Syria, or nearly half, and then the other half came from other countries. Now, the people who designed this graphic asked me one, do you think that this is a good graphic or a bad graphic? And my answer to that question is always to say, no graphic is ever bad or good in the abstract. First of all, we need to know what the graphic is for. I say, you know, if, if again, if the purpose of this graphic, as I said before, is to show that half of the migrants came from Syria and the other half came from other countries, therefore you want to emphasize Syria over the other countries, then this graphic is fine. I have nothing against it. The only change that I would make though, will be to emphasize that message even more, right? I will give myself a reason to make this following change. As long as what you want to emphasize is Syria versus the other, you need to emphasize Syria. Therefore, color Syria with one color, and then all the other countries with the same color, a little bit paler perhaps, a little bit lighter, so Syria will be further emphasized. I'm giving myself a reason to make a change in the graphic. But then I said, what if the purpose of this graphic, just for the sake of argument, is not to show parts of a whole and half versus half? What if the purpose of this graphic were comparison, right? Comparing, for example, Iraq to Afghanistan or Afghanistan to Pakistan or Pakistan to Syria. Well, if that is the purpose, then this is not a good choice. Because if you want really to compare this to this or this to that, you need to squint and then use your fingers to estimate the angles, right, and the areas of all these um, a, a, of all these segments. We have quite good empirical evidence showing that angle and area are not great encodings if what you want to enable is accurate comparisons, right? If we want to compare, we need to use other types of encodings, for example, position or length, like in a bar graph, right? We could design a bar graph. A bar graph will really help us compare these countries to each other much more accurately. And then I said, what if the purpose of this visualization is neither showing parts of a whole, half versus half, nor comparison? What if the purpose of this graphic is to show where these countries are? Or, and then whether there is an association between the proximity of these countries to Greece and the percentage of people who come from these countries to, to Greece. Well, in that case, we may need a map, right? So depending on, depending on the purpose of the graphic, we could encode our data in a different way, right? In a different way. Actually, something that I'm going to do while I speak, because this, this really bothers me, I'm going to reposition these labels. I'm not correctly positioned correctly position for some reason. So I'm going to just move them around. Anyway, so... 
the point that I'm trying to make is that one of the one of the main mistakes that beginners in data visualization make is to work in autopilot when choosing graphic forms, right? Uh, not thinking twice, not reasoning about making choices in terms of graphic forms. I know, for example, that if I give, uh, I, I have done this in workshops. If I give people in a workshop a data set in which everything adds up to 100%, and then I don't say anything other than define a visualization for me, and I don't tell them what the visualization is for, I know that most people in that room will design a pie chart. Why a pie chart, I would ask. And the reply will be, well, because everything adds up to 100%. That is not a good reason, right? A good reason would be, I want to design a pie chart because there is a half and half and so on and so forth. Then I think that the pie chart conveys the information a little bit better. But if the purpose had been comparison, then the bar chart would work a little bit, work actually better. Because you can really compare the bars to each other with reading the numbers, right? And I also know that if in that same workshop, I gave uh, the attendance, uh, um, a, a data set that contains a geographic variable, such as a uh, countries or states, or counties or regions or whatever, I know that many of them will design a map. And then I will ask, why a map? And they say, well, but because there's a geographic variable. Again, that's not a good reason. We need to think about what the purpose of the visualization is when making choices about how to depict the data. Now, fortunately, there are many resources out there that can help us make better choices when designing visualizations. One of them is the visual vocabulary by the Financial Times. There is also the data visualization catalog, tons of resources out there that can help us. The visual vocabulary is one of my favorite ones because it classifies the most common types of visualizations in columns, each one of them with a header, header that corresponds to the main tasks that that particular visualization can help with. And then the final question, I also think that this is also quite critical, is what style to use? One of the things that I tell that, that, that I tell my students in my classes is that one of the things that I dislike the most in projects is to be in their in their visualization projects is to be able to tell which visualization tool used for the graphic. So I can detect Tableau visualizations. I can detect plot visualizations. I can detect Python visualizations. I don't like that. I want the visualizations to have a specific style trying to tell, right? Adapt to sort of like notice that whoever is creating that visualization is not a computer. It is a human being making choices about color palette, about backgrounds, about font style, and so on and so forth. So one of the advice that I give them, uh, remember what I teach is visualization for communication, right? And one, one of the things that I tell them is that don't keep the defaults. Make the graphic yours, right? But not only that, I also try to instill in them the sense that visualizations in some cases need to be minimalistic and standard, right? What I call a standard visualization is bar charts, line charts, pie charts, scatter plots, corporate maps, right? Like these ones that you have here, right? This is my own style. This is the graphics that I tend to prefer. Right? Just show the data clearly as possible. These are all visualizations by the New York Times, by the way. But they are very similar to the style that I myself use in data visualization. Well, sometimes it is appropriate to try to be a little bit more creative with the data or try to show the data in an unusual way or through a different angle, perhaps, right? Once the data has already been presented in a traditional way, think about the, for example, the epidemic, right? This is all about, about COVID-19, number of cases, number of deaths, where they are concentrated and so on and so forth. Can't we give people a different angle through which they can see the data? This is what was the, the driving force between, behind one of the latest projects that I art directed. I didn't design it myself. I just art directed it. It was published by the by the Washington Post a few a few weeks ago. And the project asks the, uh, asks the question, what if all COVID-19 deaths are happening in your neighbor, are happening around you? The way that it works is that you can input any address here in the application. All right, we'll just input an address there in the United States, and this will tell you, well, the according to this, what you have input here, you are here. Now, the first person who died of COVID-19 in the United States was a person who lived in Washington State. But just for the sake of argument, let's imagine that this man didn't live in Washington, 
this man was your neighbor, right? This means that the person who lives in front of your right? The person you see every day when you're getting the mail on the street or whatever. Let's imagine that it was that person, right? Each one of these little faint dots that you see over here represents one person. This is all census data. Now, just for the sake of argument, one week later, nearly 100 people had already died of COVID-19 in the U.S. Let's imagine that all of you were your neighbors. This is how big the circle around you would be if all these deaths had happened, happened around you. And then one month later, nearly 13,000 people had died around you. And this is how big the circle would be. I can turn the labels on and off, right, to get refer geographical references. And what about now? Well, now it's even more shocking. If I go to the present, right, this still needs to be updated. It needs to go up to 225 or 230. More than 200,000 people have already died of COVID-19 in the United States. And the circle around you will be this big five kilometers around you, 3.2 miles. Now, I guess that most of you are not very familiar with the geography of Miami, but I am. I can tell you that this is enormous. This is shocking. It is shocking to see how big a number 100,000 people really is. Now, this may, as people who work with numbers every single day, you may think that this is silly, that it is silly to tell people this is how big a number is, but it's actually not silly. We have a lot of empirical evidence showing that we human beings deal with it. human beings deal, deal with a phenomenon called quantitative numbing. Quantitative numbing is behind that old saying, saying, you know, one death is a tragedy, one million deaths is a statistic. That's quantitative numbing at work. Once numbers become very, very big, it becomes very hard for the human brain to understand those numbers. For most people, for instance, there's truly not a difference between a billion and a trillion. When those numbers are obviously very, very big in comparison to each other, right? They are both big numbers, but how bigger? That's quantitative numbing at, numbing at work. So the reason why this project was designed this way was exactly to fight against that quantitative numbing effect, to help people understand the data from a more personal perspective, giving them a completely different angle through which they could see the data and sort of like perceive the magnitude of the, of the catastrophe, the magnitude of the crisis. This is how big 200,000 people really is. You never imagine it this way. And we know that the project was at least in part successful because of the reactions that it received, particularly in social media, which we tracked. Most of the reactions were like, whoa, whoa, I never imagined that this number was, was so big. So it accomplished its goal. Anyway, so this is all that I have for you today. As I said before, the last slides that I have here uh, our resources. Uh, again, when the organizers of the conference uh, uh, share the slides with you, you will be able to access them. So as I said, I, I have here one slide about visualizing uncertainty. The links that you have here, this in one in particular, this one will take you to a public Dropbox folder that I have in which I'm collecting articles and papers about how to communicate uncertainty and how to visualize it, right? There's a lot of research uh, being done these days about that and it's very worth your time. So I would encourage you to take a look at it. And then book recommendations. If this talk has sort of like gotten you interested in data visualization and you want to get started, there are excellent resources out there that you can consult to get started. First of all, free books. I get that mo guess that most of you are familiar with R for data science, which has a great introduction to data visualization in the first half of the book. So that would be my first recommendation. But moreover, Fundamentals of Data Visualization by Klaus Wilkie, which you can get for free. The draft is available for free. Um, but I usually tell my students, if you take advantage of a free book, try to support the author by buying the book as well. Right? So go ahead and buy the book, because it, this book is one of my favorite introductions to data visualizations nowadays. There are other books about the fundamentals of data visualization, including mine, if you want to consult it, particularly the truthful art, or the storytelling with data, which is a short, neat, simple, and quick and concise introduction to data visualization. Books about scientific visualization and exploratory data visualization, if you are more interested in that angle, these uh, books will be beneficial for you, I think. Books that treat data visualization from the point of business intelligence and business analytics. These are three of my three of my favorites. Books for inspiration. I am a great believer in learning by copying from other people. Copying in the sense, obviously, not of plagiarizing, but in the sense of getting inspiration from other people. These three books, these are the type of book that you can keep on your desk and sort of like browse every now and then 
when you run out of ideas of how to visualize your data. They are truly, truly inspiring. And then books about cartography. One of the areas that I think that is most overlooked in the world of data visualization is mapping. Many people who work in data visualization don't have any sort of training or knowledge about how to use maps correctly. And I think that this is important. It's not just about graphs. Data visualization is not just about charts or graph, graphs. It's also about maps. And we need to understand how to use those maps correctly. So again, these are three of my favorite books about cartography, and I greatly recommend them. Anyway, that's all that I have for today. That's the end. And I think that we have some time for questions, if I'm not wrong. Yes, we do. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed that. And I can see from the comments and the chat that's been happening that uh, I think everyone else did as well. Um, so we have a few questions. I'll start with the one that got the most votes, and it's in two parts. So do you test your charts out and others uh, to make sure that they're understood before publishing? Uh, and do you test them out on more than one person just in case people interpret them in different ways? Yes, and I do it more and more. So when I worked in journalism, the only way that I sort of like tested my graphics, before I explain it, we need to understand how journalism works. I used to work in daily newspapers. That means that you needed to produce your visualizations in a matter of 30 minutes or one hour. So there's not really a lot of time for testing. There's a lot of time for post-testing. Once the graphic is published, you show it to people, to a focus group, or to friends, family, etc., and you get their opinion. So I did a lot of that, but never systematically and never, and never scientifically. However, once we started when I started working in working in academia, I grew more used to doing that more formally. So right now I, we do that. So right now I'm designing um, a visualization for the US government, for instance, and a key part of the design process is pre-testing and post-testing. So testing that will inform the design of the graphic and testing that will inform the editing of the, of the graphic. And I don't do that testing myself though. I'm not a UX researcher. We have a UX researcher in the team, and she's the one who takes care of that type of testing. And even graphics that are not necessarily for government agents or whatever, graphics are a little more journalistic, such as the one that, that I have just shown you, the, the, the epicenter one that shows a circle around you, how many people would have died. The designers of that graphic tested the graphic. They, that graphic was produced over a, a period of one month, and they did some limited testing. They put together a small varied group of people and they show the graphic, they let people read the graphic and they ask questions about what do you learn from the graphic, right? They observed how people navigated the graphic. So it was not as strictly scientific, the, the way that you will do it in a lab, um, but it was still extremely informative. And I think that the graphic changed a little bit according to the experience that people had navigating, navigating the graphic. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, that's, that's useful to know that even an expert will will test, test their things. One of, um, yeah, related to the question before to the next one. Um, one of the things that you learn the hard way, um, being a visualization designer, is that you actually know very little. All the rules about rules about visualization, you think that they are going to, it's like you, you come to your visualizations like with a little bit of hubris sometimes, assuming that something is going to work. I'm so sure that this is going to work because I'm the expert, whatever, and you apply all your knowledge to the visualization. Nothing, no rule assists the test with people. And that's what really matters. That's, that testing is what really matters. No rule resists that test. Therefore, you need to go back to the drawing board. You need, you need to be humble enough to assume that you got it wrong and that you need to redesign it and make it a little bit better. Great. Um, do you have a favorite visualization? Or um, a favorite? I mean, aesthetically speaking, yes. I mean, there are visualizations that I like to see, right? Uh, but that doesn't necessarily make them better or worse than any other. It's just that I, I happen to enjoy them aesthetically, right? As as, as, as art, right? They create sort of like yeah. an emotional experience. I like maps. I absolutely love maps. I'm a huge fan of maps. But I know that maps are misused very often, right? And that drives me absolutely crazy. And then I love scatter plots. I absolutely love seeing mm -hmm. scatter plots for some reason. I find them fun, informative, really cool. But again, they are also one of the most dangerous types of visualizations, right? Because it's very, very easy to infer a causal link just because of a, just because of a scatter plot. So I'm also very aware of the potential dangers of the visualizations that I like the most, as that is speaking. 
Okay, great. Uh, so I'll move on to the next question. So it's sometimes best practice seems difficult to establish with so much information out there on data visualization. Have you got any tips for teams working together to establish good style guides? Well, well, do have a style guide. That that's that's actually a very good a very good um, a piece of advice. So try to have a style guide, but don't use the style guide as a sort of like a something that will impose limitations on what you can do. The style guide is the starting point or the springboard. It will show you, it, it should include what you should do most of the time, but it should not limit you to doing something better if you need to. So it needs to be flexible enough um, uh, to sort of like encompass potential innovations, new ways to show data, new color palettes, etc. cetera. Um, testing is super important. The, the testing part is super, super important. Even if, as I said before, even if it is more informal and not that scientific, just showing your graphic to people, to a varied, um, a varied group of people can be extremely, extremely helpful. Never assume that what you design will be what people will understand. Those are two completely different things and we need to try to bridge that gap. Um, try to take advantage of the um, uh, different expertises that your team has. So try to build teams that are also very diverse, right? Try to, and they try to have minimal, meaningful conversations in those teams. Diverse in all senses of the word, by the way, right? Not, uh, in terms of skills, in terms of gender, in terms of, uh, in terms of race, in terms of background. Try to be as diverse as possible because people sometimes will bring perspectives to the table that you, not, you, had, never think, you had never thought about. Out, right we need to assume and this is one of my sort of like my uh one of the ideas that i would like to write about more um in the future at some point only that i need to find a way to include it in a, in a book about visualization which is that I, I believe that knowledge doesn't reside in individual brains our brains are extremely limited knowledge resides in the networks of brains that's why teamwork is so important and even if you work solo you can still work in teams because you can sort of like show your work to people who are different than you are. I do that all the time. Whenever I write a book, I show it to a huge variety of people, with different backgrounds, different expertises, and so on and so forth. It's because each one of them is going to give me feedback that is going to be different to the other people. They're going to give me different perspectives and they're going to open my eyes to things that I had not even noticed before. So that's also super important. In the dynamics of the in the dynamics of the team. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, so, what tools do you use to produce uh, camera-ready visualizations um, or production-ready? Anything that gets the job done. <laughs> so, I I use a huge variety of things. So, um, for the static visualizations, I use a huge variety of tools to generate what I call base graphics. So I use ggplot, I use Tableau, I use, I don't know, I use tons of different things, Flourish uh, and, uh, and other visualization tools. Um, if it is for, a, as I said before, a static graphics, print graphics, then what I do is to export those graphics from, uh, from the tools, from those tools, R, whatever, uh, Tableau, etc. And I bring them into a design tool called Adobe Illustrator which is a vector-based design tool that lets you polish the appearance of the graphic to make it look more presentable and more professional. And so that's sort of like the workflow that I follow. For interactive data visualizations, I, I just use JavaScript, JavaScript and D3. Uh, I am not an expert in JavaScript and D3. So whenever I, I face the uh, sort of like the prospect of designing an interactive data visualization that is going to be published in the web, I will not design it myself. I may design the mockups, the visual mockups of the interface and what the visualization is going to look like, but then I partner up with developers, right? The programmers who know a lot about JavaScript and D3 because my knowledge of D3 is extremely, extremely limited. So I cannot do it on my own. Yeah, no, that, I guess that's why we have colleagues with different skills. So it's mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Try to yeah. try to become friends with people with different skills. Yeah. Yeah, That's also true of data, data exploration, for instance, when you know, the exploratory data analysis phase and understanding of the data, that's something that I usually don't do myself, just because I don't have domain-specific expertise on anything that I cover. If I, need, if I do a graphic about epidemiology or pandemics, 
I will partner up with epidemiologists. I would not do the data exploration and stuff because that, that would be a little bit crazy, right? You need to sort of like identify potential partners that you can that you can partner up with that you can, that can help you. Yeah. And I think we've got time for one last question. I think the other one we've covered. So if we're not able to explain our visualizations out loud, like we saw Aunt Rosling do in the news, how can we create an annotation layer that people will actually read and engage with? Well, what I, something that I forgot to say about the during the presentation before is that you can always include alternative text, right? You can always include a textual explanation of your visualization, and that serves two different purposes. It will help a regular reader understand the visualization better. If they don't understand something in the graphic, they can refer to the alternative text. But it also increases the accessibility of the graphic. A visually impaired person comes to your graphic, they cannot see your graphic, but the computer will be able to read the alternative text to them. But that's actually one of the recommendations that I, that I usually give for whenever it is possible. It's not always possible, but whenever it is possible, include alternative text. Now, how to help people engage with that text? That's sort of like an open-ended question. It's similar to how, how, how can you make people engage with a visualization? But really not a correct answer to that, to that, to that question. Try to make it engaging, right? Try to make the text concise, but understandable and deep enough. Um, try to make it fun, if possible. Try to include sort of like if you can and the and the topic is appropriate, try to include a little bit of humor, right? If in the in the text, because that humor puts people in a good mood, and being in a good mood opens your mind to 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 absorb information more readily. Um, and look for inspiration on how to write good text for your graphics. I really like, for example, the Economist magazine, uh, the way that they write the titles for their graphics. The ti their titles are usually little little jokes or little buttons um, that are related to the data somehow or little workplace and i really like that approach i'm not saying that that is the right approach but i'm just saying that is one of the possible approaches that we can take to make our text a little bit more lively not merely not merely descriptive but also evocative in some sense mm. and just to follow you mentioned accessibility do you have any kind of resources to make your plot small or visualizations more accessible <laughs> So there's a lot of writing being done about that in a lot. Some writing being done right now in, in a, the Data Visualization Society's a magazine. It's called Nightingale. So just Google Data Visualization Society Nightingale and you will find it. That's the online, the online publication. I don't have specific references right now. Accessibility in data visualization is actually one of the areas that I would like to learn more about because the only recommendations that I can give so far are, you know, pretty basic, I, I, I would guess, right? To try to use color palettes that are color blind friendly, for example, right? That's a, a, that's a mistake that I've made in the past myself, using non-color, not color blind friendly color palettes in my in my graphics in the past. Try to include alternative text whenever it is possible or annotations at least, even if it is not a full blown alternative text, at least an introduction that sort of like explains the main messages that that graphic is, that graphic is, is conveying. Try to use font sizes that have good contrast over the background. Sometimes journalists and designers, we tend to design graphics and, and we want them to look elegant and subtle and we tend to use fonts that are very thin and very faint and very light just because they look really cool but then they are very hard to read and i'm getting older and i hate not being able to read the text on a computer screen right um so i guess that most of the advice that can be given about making a visualization accessible is actually not that different to the advice that you would give to a person who is designing a website that is also intended to be accessible as well Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think that's, um, I think it's, a, it's an interesting topic to uh, to make sure that everyone can access our, our visualizations. There's one last question, which I think you might have covered. So graphic designer or package for charting, do you need to be both? Say, say that again, sorry? So graphic designer or package for charting, do you need to be both? I think this might be linked to do you need your plotting software to do everything or is it okay to do a touch up um, oh you, you cover no no visualization package will do everything for you it is very as i said before i use different visualization 
different visualization tools. I don't produce everything in a single visualization. Uh, even people who do visualization for the web, they usually don't use just D3, for example, which is the library uh, used um, nowadays mostly to create the visualization. They use a variety of tools for different for different purposes. Um, so I would say no, no, no package will do everything everything for you. And then in terms of knowledge, right? We all we all need to be. If we want to design visualizations. We all need to be both. Um, I would say data storytellers or data reasoners. We need to be able to think about the numbers correctly. Uh, we need to be data writers, people who can explain the data verbally, or at least the sort of like the elevator speech of the data. Mm -hmm. But we also need to be designers, visual designers, because design this is, is another misconception. It's another myth that is very common. Many people tend to believe that design is about making things prettier. And certainly design is sort of like related to that, but it's not the only thing that, or even the main thing that design is about. Design is about structuring information in a meaningful way in order for that information to make sense for a particular audience. That's what design is. And it's a skill and it's something that can be taught and that can be learned through, learned through mm -hmm. practice. So again, the key again is not the package that you use or the tool that you use, it's how you use it and what you use it for. I've seen people creating amazing graphics just with ggplot2. It's only that if I had to do the same thing myself, I would rather patients in ggplot2 because I would need to sort of like hack ggplot2 to do certain design decisions, to make certain design decisions. I run out of patients. I will just create a graphic in ggplot. I will export it, bring it to Adobe Illustrator, and make the changes in Illustrator, just because I'm more used to doing it that way. But that doesn't mean that you cannot use ggplot2 for that as well, if you know how to use it really, really well, right? And sort of like accomplish the same thing that I did, the same level of sophistication and beauty and elegance in your graphics. And it's not the package. It's the person who is using that package. That really nice. Yeah, I think uh, that all makes sense. And I think the recommendation that no one language can do everything or one package can't do everything uh, might be a good place to uh, to stop because it's now 20 past five here. Um, so thank you very much for your presentation and thank you everyone thank for you. joining us. Um, we've had some very interesting discussions in the chat as well. Um, and I think Anastasia might join us for a, a, a few last comments. Yes, thank you uh, again. So thank you again, Al 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 Alberto. Sorry, I, I can't even speak after this. It was so intense and so amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, I mean, as you know, NGS our community is community of NHS and public sector data analysts. So we all do work with data a lot. They can see clapping is happening as well in the background in the chat. So we work with data a lot and it's very important for us to deliver messages right. And uh, I can see your talk resonated in our hearts a lot. So thank you again for doing this. And thank you, Emma, for facilitating absolutely great uh, uh, talk. So Albert, if you have to go, uh, you're welcome to go now. Uh, we'll hope you enjoy this experience as well. Uh, and thank you for having me. We will keep an eye on your Twitter and website uh, and good luck. Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. And before everyone else leaves, I'll just quickly share my screen um, now uh, just, just to talk a bit about tomorrow. So uh, I do it all the time. So as usually, hopefully you can see a program for Thursday. Uh, ooh, give me a second. I think my laptop is tied to the conference now. Um, so as Tom said in the chat, we have early bird coffee morning at half eight. If you want to join, please let us know. Hopefully you have a link in the email. If you don't have a link, just email us or ask me here on chat or ask me on Slack. We will find the way to find you. Um, tomorrow is very nice plenary talk session as well. Uh, we have uh, quite a few perspectives from charity. We have Kate Hume from British Heart Foundation, as well as talk about uh, how to prevent human trafficking. Uh, we also have Gary Hudson. Gary, I think you're still here, hopefully who will talk about uh, computer vision and how it can assist clinicians. Um, also, we, have, we, can, uh, we will have William uh, from uh, Data Lab. So he is a colleague uh, from Ben Caldecker, and I'm sure Ben mentioned uh, will talk on Monday. So please join in for this one. Um, we, have, uh, uh, we have also training pathways um, uh, talk, as well as uh, some academic perspective from Ina Kostakis. And also we will have uh, Michael from uh, Health Economics uh, Outcomes Research 
uh, who will talk about my sedate and how to deal with this. Uh, yeah, I can see Gary's here. Yeah, we're looking forward for your talk, Gary. Um, and uh, also, uh, tomorrow's will be a bit different, different structure. Uh, we will have afternoon with uh, our colleagues from the USA. Uh, we will have uh, uh, quite a good representation from our studio. Uh, but last but not least, we will have Alison Horst. And I'm sure many of you heard about her. And I'm also sure many of you heard about her from the conference. Uh, she's absolute legend in our illustrations. So please join if you can. Uh, I appreciate it's quite late for the UK. Uh, attendees but hopefully some American attendees can listen to me now and also join and I think it's pretty much everything I wanted to say once again thank you for joining uh, thank you for staying uh, till the end of this day three and I will see you all tomorrow goodbye <laughs>